Welcome back to The Breakfast here on PLOS TV Africa. It's now time for Off the Press, where we have, of course, our review of the major stories making headlines across the country this morning. Uh, we will be speaking with our analyst, uh, Mr. Ambrose Igboke, uh, who's joining us uh, via Zoom. Good morning. Thanks for joining us, sir. Good morning. Thanks Good morning. for having me today. All right. Good let's morning. Kick, let's uh, kick off with stories from the uh, Daily Independent uh, this morning. Should be on your screen in just a few seconds. There you have it. It says here, Nigeria heading for bankruptcy. PDP governors raise uh, the alarm. Reject federal government's reason for Twitter ban. Also, 2023, no vacancy in Lagos government house. APC leaders tell Bajabia Miller, Hamzat and others. Uh, customers dump POS, return to banks, uh, ATM and other channels. Lalong charges community on surveillance as gunmen kill 12 in Joss. South-South leaders berate Buhari over a dot-in-circle remark against Southeast. End terrorism in Yoruba land, pan-Yoruba groups tell federal government. And also how my successor will emerge, that's from uh, the Kano State Governor Ganduji. Uh, Shoinka, uh, Wale Shoinka, beg your pardon, says that Buhari should start talking like a leader. And, uh, of course, moving to the south, South, it says here, open grazing is buried in southern Nigeria. That's from Clark. Condemns federal government's uh, a northern elders' silence over jihadist ultimatum to Delta. Rebel youth leaders vow to enforce open grazing ban. Give herders 48 hours to quit Delta. And uh, also, uh, alleged diversion of 61.1 uh, billion naira. Senate probes NSITF. Those are the stories on the Daily Independent. And moving on now to the next newspaper, we're looking at the punch. The headline reads, Buhari regime borrows $2.02 billion from China. $719.61 million used to service Chinese loans since inception in 2015. PDP governors lampoon Buhari over huge debt profile CBN's operations. Terminal operators to join planned Apapa port reconstruction. That's according to the federal government. Naira tumbles by 51.95% despite CBN defense measures. 12 states battle IDP crisis. Communities, firms, deserted. Bandits going round Zamfara farms to prevent planting. And 113 towns deserted. Also, one million displaced in Benue, eight local governments face humanitarian crisis in camps. NSITF chiefs appear in Senate today over alleged 61 billion naira diversion. Telecom services face disruption as workers threaten strike. Also on the Punch newspaper, two more suspects arrested over Oshun female teenager killed by ritualists. Pandef and Men says will respond appropriately to Fulani attack on Delta. How monarchs elite aid herdsmen atrocities, Ikiti farmers. Outrageous federal government demolishes 12 Lagos churches on alleged illegal plots. Okoje attacks Buhari regime, says anarchy looms in Nigeria. And lastly, on the Punch newspaper, Umahi defends Buhari's appointments, says Southeast governors' youth meet on Sunday. The Nigerian Tribune comes up next. Food prices soar, push more Nigerians into poverty. Democracy Day, Buhari's speech exposed him as one not serving Nigeria's interests. And, uh, okay, I think we're going to skip the Tribune. Might be, um, uh, let's move over to the Daily Sun uh, instead. Um, we, of course, once again talking about uh, Professor Wale Shoinka on the Daily Sun. It says Shoinka warns of looming breakup, recommends decentralization as remedy, kicks against open grazing. One killed, six abducted as headsmen attack Inugu community. Headsmen kill 13, injure others in Plateau, Aquaibom. PDP governors raise alarm over federal government's rise in debt. And um, Eboni has no land to give headers for ranching, says uh, Governor Omahi. Democracy Day, nothing to celebrate, says Northern Khan. Mend, SMBLF, and Clark promise Fulani jihadists fire for fire. Vow to protect zone from attack by killer headsmen. And they're also second, Saraki, Udom, others, Storm, Calabar, issue Ayade, quit notice. Those are the stories on the Daily Sun. And lastly, let's look at uh, the headlines on the Guardian newspaper. 
Nigeria on suicide slide may not see another June 12 uh, showing cow wounds. Urges presidents to stop excluding false, exuding false confidence. Listen to citizens restructure the country. PDP governors decry FG's excessive borrowing and NPC's OPEC operations. Once Twitter ban reviewed in nation's interest. Also on The Guardian, inflation devaluation pushed millennials away from 20 trillion Naira stock market. pan Yoruba group seek end to terrorism, support self-determination. Senate probes NSICF for alleged 61.1 billion Naira diversion. COVID-19 shortens Africa's blood banks by 17%. 17 people killed in fresh plateau attack. Outrage as 600 NNPC applicants lament exclusion two years after exercise. I think those are the stories we're looking at this morning. A warm welcome again to you, Mr. Ibokwe, Public Affairs Analyst. Yeah, thank you very much. Ibokwe, please. Yes, Ibokwe. Um, on the different newspapers we've seen this morning, there's a warning here by uh, Shrinka saying that Nigeria may not see another June 12 and that the country is on a suicide slide. Um, do you agree with this perspective? Yeah, uh, to the referred uh, Nobel laureate, um, we have had this kind of uh, warnings too many times and at the end of the day, it's, uh, it doesn't come to uh, fruition. I remember that uh, between 2014, um, when Nigeria's amalgamation was 100 years old, we are being told between 2012 and 2013 that, that the contract for uh, amalgamation of Nigeria was 100 years and that by January 1st, 2014, it will be 100 years and that Nigeria will cease and each uh, nationality can go their way. Uh, we, are still, we are still here, uh, almost uh, seven years uh, later. Seven years later, we are still here. So what is happening now is that um, I would rather to the line of uh, Bishop Hassan Fuka in his book, uh, one of the, his books, he said that, uh, that the unity of Nigeria is like a Catholic marriage. Uh, it may not be happy, but it doesn't break up. Um, that is what we have been experiencing over the years. Um, we just, it's just a policy shift of the government, one policy shift of the government that to make things come back to normal. Um, if we go the right path, for example, the latest uh, incident that is hitting the polity hard is the uh, headers uh, uh, killer activities, uh, burning farmland, destroying crops, uh, looting, uh, raping women, killing uh, sacking the whole villages and murdering people. If that policy, and that is because some, uh, they are being allowed to do it freely, if they are confronted and uh, decimated by the military, then Nigeria will go back to peace and prosperity. So just one policy shift that will make Nigeria better. But uh, uh, Nigerians have a way of coming back and bouncing back after all the crisis. Imagine, imagine 1993. Between 1993 uh, and 1994, it was a big, it was a very big crisis in Nigeria. Universities were shut down. Nadeko was there. Uh, the June 12 crisis, everything. Uh, I remember that uh, universities missed one year. It was a very rough period. Yes, we came out of that. Uh, so um, I, I'm not enthusiastic about that comment. And uh, uh, we have said so many times before and nothing happened. All right. Um, also to get your thoughts on uh, the uh, Southern leaders. And of course, Edwin Clark, mostly in the papers this morning, saying that uh, the president's call for grazing routes, you know, will not be accepted by southern Nigeria and uh, the ban on open grazing stands. There's also been um, uh, uh, some uh, uh, groups in the Niger Delta making you know, similar stands. Uh, so let's get your well, views on the president still pushing for grazing um, routes across the country and the reaction from uh, southern leaders. I think Nigeria has gone beyond that. I mean, a law of 1964, a gas uh, of 1964 cannot apply in 2021. It's not possible. Um, even uh, some have argued that uh, the Land Use Act uh, that was enacted in, I think, 1976 uh, uh, or 78 uh, has also, uh, in a way, abrogated that gazette. And that other acts of parliament over the years, I mean, we had the 1979 uh, democratic rule. We have uh, the 1991 to 93 experiment. Then we, since 1999 to now, we have had uh, acts and other things. So uh, that's... It doesn't apply anymore in the 
modern realities of uh, Nigeria. People are going ranching now. So uh, 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 it is very clear that it's not going to work. Whose land are you going to take for grazing roads? When they were talking about grazing roads, most Nigerian uh, population were just restricted and uh, the access was just there. I mean, uh, this was almost, uh, we are talking about uh, uh, more than 60 uh, something years ago, almost 60 years ago. So it doesn't apply in modern era. The modern era of uh, cattle rearing is ranching. So that you can even um, gain from the ancillary and offshoot uh, services that come with ranching. For example, uh, the dairy part of it, uh, the meat processing part of it, and all those things. When you have ranches, you can properly plan along the value chain and uh, the offshoots of uh, uh, cattle rearing. The, fertilizer, the manure that you get from it, the uh, uh, meat processing, the packaging, uh, the standardization. Uh, you are talking about the dairy aspects and all the offsets, uh, things that come from dairy. So we have to look forward to take uh, ranching as a very serious business. Uh, uh, ranching is uh, cattle rearing. Uh, it is not, uh, it's not cultural. It is a business. So we should stop uh, painting it as if it's a culture of uh, a particular uh, group of people. Anybody can go into cattle rearing. So it's, a, it's pure business. And uh, the 2021 is not a time to reactivate the uh, grazing routes. It will work. Yeah, but, but, but why do you think the president is still pushing for grazing routes? Even, of I, course, seeing what, what these, uh, the crisis this is causing across the country. Well, what I think is that uh, there are some people around the president who are not uh, being fair to the president, who are giving him ill advice and uh, who uh, don't mean well for the president and the country. Uh, because from the, uh, from the uh, statements that emanate from these, uh, his left lieutenants, you'll find out that uh, they, 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 that is their mindset. And these are the kind of things they feed the president with. So um, we have to look critically also at those who are, for example, uh, the attorney general. I mean, for him to be comparing, look at the comparison he did with uh, spare parts, uh, uh, sellers the other time. And so these are, the, these are the kind of quality of advice the president gets. And uh, uh, it is unfortunate that the people around him are not doing him any good. Okay, I want us to turn to the Punch newspaper now to see um, a review that he put of, of the past six years to say um, Buhari regime borrows $2.02 billion from China. And uh, when we compare this to the Zambian experience where, um, you know, the international airports of the country, their broadcasting corporation, their power uh, corporation as well, you know, had to be used to settle debts to China. H how, how can we use that to uh, make comments about Nigeria's uh, status, you know, and how it borrows huge sums in the billions of dollars from China? Well, first of all, there are two issues raised here. One is borrowing and the other one is borrowing from China. Now, we have been borrowing over the years. We have been borrowing from the Paris Club. We have been borrowing from different IMF, different World Bank, and different agencies. And uh, now, as particular conditions. Now, China is pushing to uh, take over Africa in terms of investment, in terms of loans. From my little research, I found out that uh, China offers very little interest in its loan, very, very little interest. And so that is why a lot of people are going for it. Now, um, what are the terms? The terms in Zambia uh, may not be the same terms in uh, Nigeria. I have not seen the Nigerian terms of uh, the loans, uh, but if Zambia uh, is taking its national assets for uh, the loan as collateral, uh, that is Zambia's uh, uh, own uh, issue. But for Nigeria, I have not heard that we, st uh, we take our national asset to get the loan. Uh, for example, the Um, Ms. Ebuke, are you, are you still there? Okay, well, we hope we, we, we get back to him soon because I think that's even the major challenge here. The agreements between Nigeria and China to borrow, it's not in public the domain. So because we don't even know what the agreement stipulates, it's even hard for us to begin to, to say what exactly is at stake. Are we certain, are we putting our, our national assets at stake like, like was done in Zambia? So these issues really need to be dissected to find out what Nigeria stands to lose or gain from borrowing so much from China as it stands. Um, Mr. Ambrose, okay, are you still there? I was saying that on the other part, on the, okay. on the loan part, uh, on the loan part itself, uh, that uh, I remember the President Olusegun Obasanjo and with Kogi Wala then, 
uh, wiped out our, our debt from the Paris Club and a lot of agencies and were on clean slate. Over the years, we went back to borrowing. And now the debt that are hanging on us uh, is, so, is so fast that um, well, I think we are in serious uh, economic trouble. Remember that the governor of uh, Edo State, uh, Godwin Obaseki, did tell us last time that we have started printing money. And that is to show you that that is why the inflation is, so, uh, is where it is. Then the agricultural uh, revolution that we are thinking that will help us out of oil is being threatened by insecurity. People can no longer go to their farm and a lot is uh, happening. So how do we pay back this loan? So uh, is there any uh, caveat that says if we cannot pay, that we start mortgaging our, our national assets? So I, I, it is time for, uh, uh, I think, the media, the journalists, and the rest to uh, start doing investigative reporting to find out what are the terms, what are the conditions, what are the things. Uh, investigative journalism is almost dead in Nigeria. It's a sad commentary on what the media has become in, in, in this last few years, where we have become just events reportage going on everywhere, uh, press releases and all those kind of things. What has happened to uh, scoop? What has happened to all those kind of things? So the public should not be grappling uh, for information. I mean, there should be exclusive uh, investigative reporting. And that is what the press owes the Nigerian society. And unless we do that, we'll continue to be in the dark because we don't know what is happening. So all these things we group, we ask for, well, these things can be found out. So I challenge the press, which is our own forte, to do more. Uh, especially the, the people in journalism to do more uh, than what we are currently doing. Because right now, the press itself, I would rather say it's not performing to standard in trying to unravel all this kind of uh, uh, mysteries that declared our economy and other aspects of our national life. Yes, okay. Mr. Iboke, we can definitely do better. And uh, still talking about um, insecurity, all across the papers, we're seeing Headsman Q13 in Plateau, in Aqua Bomb, and we're seeing here in the Punch newspaper, 12 states battle IDP crisis about uh, towns that are also deserted, local governments deserted. Uh, you turn to the Guardian newspaper, still stories about insecurity on the Daily Independence as well, uh, gunmen Q12 in Joss. Really, what, what's your, what's your uh, commentary regarding the state of our security and how it seems like routine now to see stories about deaths and killings, you know, in, in every part of the country? You know, just a couple, year, couple of years ago, uh, we read stories about what happened in uh, Afghanistan. We read stories of what happened in Yemen. We read stories of what happened in Syria and sometimes in, uh, in Pakistan and Palestine. Uh, we never thought that Nigeria would suffer from uh, this. Uh, and now it has become a daily occurrence for us. Um, it, it's become part of our lives where people are being killed. And what's the value of human life in Nigeria? Even the presidency is tired of issuing statements. Before, when it started, they used to issue statements. Uh, those days uh, of uh, Jonathan, they issued statements. Even the uh, current presidency issued statements. Now we don't even hear statements anymore. So that becomes, it has become part of our life. Uh, it's just like somebody saying, you issue statement when you eat. You don't issue statement when you eat. So this is where we have um, actually dived to. I mean, we have descended to. We are killing of our fellow citizens, killing of our people have become a, a normalcy. And that is the sad reality of our current existence in Nigeria. All right, finally, I think you could just quickly speak on the uh, story on the Daily Independent. It says uh, South South. Uh, leaders berate Buhari over dot in circle remark against um, the Southeast. Uh, do you think that might also, you know, be taken out of context or, you know, their rights to, um, you know, say what they are saying? Well, I, well, sometimes when I see reactions between groups and the presidency and the rest, I start wondering what has happened to back-end uh, back channels in diplomacy and the governmental relationships? Um, I, is that missing? Are, people, are, the, are the people in the presidency uh, restricting or obstructing people from having access to the president? What is really happening? Because some of the things you see in the newspapers are some of the things that you could a group as, uh, you know, elite groups like that or statesmen like that could actually go up to the president or have a chat with the president and say, look at this, look at this, sit behind closed doors, come out with policies, and then, you know, implement. If that is not happening, then there's a problem between 
a communication between the presidency and the citizens. And when citizens resort uh, to uh, this kind of um, rhetoric, then, then that means there is a problem. Therefore, the uh, handlers of the president should be able to open up communication channels between uh, uh, you know, civil groups like this, between uh, uh, cultural, um, cultural groups like this, between uh, religious uh, organizations, or between every stakeholder that uh, uh, has something to say, to be able to have access at least to communicate with the president and discuss issues. Because some of these issues are not issues we are supposed to see in the newspaper. Uh, a lot of also conflicts and crises happen in other countries. But there's a way that they, you know, they go behind the, the, the channel. There are lobby groups, there are pressure groups that are discuss, uh, discussant. There are representatives of groups that we go and uh, you know, have discussion uh, behind closed doors and then they, you know, they sort it out. So as a public relation consultant myself, I, I find it very, very uh, worrisome that little things that could have been discussed behind closed doors and they uh, ironed out between the presidency and the citizens are left to be bandied around the newspapers and being given press conferences left, right, and center. So if it is the handlers of bread that are actually blocking people from having access to the president, they are not doing the president any good. They should open up their channel so that uh, uh, he's, he's our president. He's not their president. So he's our president. So uh, when, when they want to take ownership of the president, it's not fair on Nigeria. We, uh, we voted for him. We, uh, he's our president. So we should have access to him. And so those, uh, those groups should also have access to him. And in that way, some of these things that you hear that are exclusive in the newspapers can actually be ironed out easily and then diplomatically, and then solutions can be brought so that we, all we can see is actions that will lead to a peaceful Nigeria that will ultimately lead to prosperity for the country and the city. All right. Ambrose Igboke, thank you so much uh, for your time. Thanks for speaking with us this morning. And uh, we wish you a great you uh, Tuesday ahead. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay. Stay with us. A uh, short break. When we come back, uh, what happened on this day many, many years ago? I'm going back to the year 2012 to tell you about uh, a really, really risky uh, feat that, of course, uh, broke world records. And a very sad incident in the history of our country in 2014.